I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I realize I've been influenced by my dad. So for me, um, my dad, uh, he, he loved to fix things. He, we, we make fun of him for this a little bit, but the truth is I actually really respect him for it. He, he would collect uh, yogurt containers. Because if you have the right, have enough plastic, you can, from the yogurt container and epoxy, you can fix almost anything. And he did. So he, he was born in the UK, uh, but was, uh, it was just right, right around the, the end of World War II. And so that was, he was raised in the time of like the, the, the rations, and you probably either maybe experienced that or heard about that. And so, so he didn't want to waste anything. Um, and as it turns out, as I get older, I, actually, I really, enjoy, well, I'm not quite as frugal as he is. I, I say frugal, it's a nice way to say I'm cheap, but I'm not quite there, but um, I like fixing stuff. I like fixing stuff. That's part of my father's legacy in me. You know, we've all been influenced by our earthly dads. So what are some ways that your father, your earthly father, has influenced you? So let's just, just shout them out. Hardworking. Hardworking. Way to go, Lana. Patience. Patience. Honesty. Honesty. Good word. Oh, leaving a lot again? Loved. Love of family. Yeah, I heard another in there. Faith. Yes. Get louder. Frugal. And he, he's sitting right there, isn't he? There we go. Okay. Hey, I, we just figured out who's paying for lunch. That is good. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm glad you're in worship today. Okay. <laughs> so... Over here, how about some ways that your, your earthly father influenced you? Love of, reading. Love of reading, what a great legacy. Love of nature. Love of nature, yeah. Hard work. Hard work. Oh, you emphasize that like. Well, he, worked hard. he worked hard. He worked hard and he taught, did he teach you? Well, he taught you how to work hard. I know you. <laughs> On the, music. music, what a great legacy. Sacrifice, Sacrifice. yeah. Humor, love it. He loved everybody. So our fathers make a tremendous difference in our lives. And, and so I wanted us to take uh, a little bit of time today to look at, um, well, especially it's in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, take a look there. It is the New Testament expression of the kind of this foundational discipleship idea of the Old Testament. And so we're going to take a quick look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, ironically also starting with verse 4, but verses 4 through 8, because, you know, this is, this is how it's expressed in the Mosaic law, and then we're going to see how it's expressed in the New Testament law, or New Testament teaching, I should say. And I, I think it's going to be, I hope it's going to be really practical. Now, I'm going to warn you a little bit. Um, you, you already heard hinted. I, I am in the middle of a doctorate, and so I'm in the middle of a dissertational project, and Ephesians 6.4 is right at the very center of it. So I've, I've been doing, like, really significant nerd work uh, in this passage. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the best I can to... to uh, preach through something I'm enormously passionate about as quickly as I, as I reasonably can. Now, my, my dissertational project is, now this is one of the things I love about getting a chance to do, in this case, a, a doctor of ministry program, is they ask you, so what is the, big, the biggest problem in the world that you see today that you'd like to do something about? And for me, the answer ended up being pretty simple, is... It's how we are pace, passing our faith on to the next generation. For me, at least, at least for me, I, I believe that is the, the number one issue in the church. And actually, if you really stretch it out a little bit, this is actually the number one issue in Western culture. My doctoral mentor, um, Leonard Sweet, likes to say, any animal that fails to reproduce itself is an endangered species. That tells us that the, the, the church in the Western world, now some amazing things are happening in the global south and in the global east. Amazing revival in those places. But here in the West, in, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, um, 
we are about to be the first generation in 1,700 years where Christians will be the minority. We're about to be. And so how we pass on our faith to the next generation is vitally important. It's the whole ballgame. I realize we're about to get all excited about elections and all those things. They are super important. Yes, they are. This is bigger. And and this is an issue that has been developing not just over the last uh, political cycle, but for decades. And if as, as the church, capital C, the church in Western America, or our Western world, doesn't better figure out how to pass on its faith to the next generation, um, it's gonna have really serious consequences, not only for your family and the people that you love and the legacy that you wanna leave in the world, but actually for Western civilization itself. So I'm real passionate about it, if you can't tell. Um, And and so in the Old Testament, as as, as Moses is instructing the people, guided by, the, guided by God's, God's Holy Spirit leading him, he says this, this, this foundational passage, the Shema, hear, O Israel, excuse me. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your lavav, with all of your soul, with all your strength, your maod. All of it. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols to your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And so, in Israelite culture, whether that was in the the nation of Israel or in all these kind of sub-colonies of Jews, they would do quite literally that. I mean, in an effort to pass on the faith to the next generation, they would wear the Shema, those words. They would wear them bound to their foreheads. They'd wear them as part of their clothing. They would be on the the doorpost of the home. Who here is is a fan of the series The Chosen? Yeah, one of the things I like about that is it gives us a little bit of a historical picture of what that would look like. And you see people as they're walking into a house, they take a moment to, to acknowledge, to uh, like, like leave a, like uh, blow a kiss, I guess you could say, to the doorposts of the house. They're surrounding themselves with this awareness that we are the people of God. It's everywhere. Modern day lingo that would might be things like wristbands and t-shirts and the music in your house and you took that trip to Hobby Lobby and so you got those phrases up on the wall. Like you, that we, we saturate our homes and we saturate our conversations with awareness of God. Now, as, as the Jesus movement starts to sweep across the Roman Empire uh, and, and people are coming to Christ who are not ethnically Jewish, Paul finds himself, the Apostle Paul, having to give instructions to the church in Ephesus. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, is this foundational verse. And I'd like us to read it or to speak it out loud together, and then we're going to really, really deep dive into it. And to almost literally every word, but every word in the word matters. And, and um, the, the deeper you dig, the more we find. So this passage is rich. All right, let's, let's, let's speak these words out loud together. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, but instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Okay. You ready to dive deep? You got your thinking caps on? Secured firmly? I don't believe you. Okay, the very first word in there is fathers, fathers. The Greek word there is pateres. And um, if you have a modern translation, you probably see a little, um, little, 
like footnote or something like that. This, there's actually some translational questions about whether to best translate this word as fathers or parents. Let's talk about why. Donde esta uh, mis, mis amigos que aquí uh, hablan español? Okay, very nice. So what is, what is the word for father in Spanish? Padre. Now, in the, in the plural, padres, does that mean always groups of fathers, or what can that also mean? Parents. That's, that's the parents. So the Greek word there could be translated either way, and it's important that we recognize that, because if we just see that word fathers, we can end up with, it, with the, the assumption that it's all about the fathers, and there's no word in there for the, for the mothers. And yet throughout the scriptures, we see this in the way that, that the Israelites discipled their children, and we see it in the Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs, where like verse after verse after verse after verse basically says, listen to your mom, listen to your mom, listen to your mom, listen to your mom. Wisdom means listening to your mom as well as your dad. So it's clear, it's clear that both men and women, mothers and fathers, were involved in discipleship. It's absolutely clear. But I do think in this particular passage that the modern translators got it right. And that in this particular passage, the word paters is here best translated as fathers, and here's why. It's because of the phrase that immediately follows it. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, or do not paragizo your children. Do not exasperate. Do not um, provoke them to wrath. Do not make them angry. Do not make them resentful of you. Because here, this is something that was true in the Greco-Roman world, and it's also true to a lesser degree in our world today. See, mothers and fathers both play an important role in raising up their kids, but here's the, here's the thing about dads. Dads have a greater capacity to screw it up. And here's why. Now, in the Greco-Roman world, it was a very machismo culture. Like, the dad ruled the house. And so the father could do almost anything pretty much short of murdering his kids, and he would get away with it. The father was so much the like, ruler of his home, the master of his domain, that it was not uncommon for the father to not, to not only have the relationship with his family, but to have some other relationships on the side. And nobody really thought ill of that. That was normal Greco-Roman behavior, including things like, and I, I want to be, I'm going to use euphemistic terms here because there's kids in the, in the, in the room. When they, when they would visit the Greco-Roman temples, there would be things happening in those Greco-Roman temples that we, that are very much not G-rated. And it was normal it was normal, normal, normal for the guys to do that. So they could totally get away with that. So here you have these, these fathers, these, these uh, uh, you know, Greeks, who Greek-speaking and Greek-enculturated people who are coming to Christ, and they're trying to learn how to be Christian dads. And so the Apostle Paul starts off with this instruction, fathers, fathers, don't provoke your kids to wrath. Don't provoke them to anger. Because, you know, your hypocrisy, if you fail to live out what you're really saying, you, that, can, that can really, really wound their spirits. Because here I'm not talking about the anger of, oh, you, you tripped over their Lego set and you, and you busted the Millennium Falcon. I mean, this is not about you showed up late for soccer practice. This is... Uh, is if you, Dad, you're telling me about following Jesus, and here's the problem. I don't want to be anything like you. You're telling me about being faithful, and yet I know you're not faithful to mom. You're telling me about sexual purity, and you know what? I've seen your internet search history. You're telling me that you're too busy to go to Bible study, but you're never, ever late for fishing season, so I know it's not about your calendar. 
You're telling me, yeah, I heard you over, or, you know, talking to mom about, oh, I wish we could give to charity. I wish we don't have any money. And I heard you bragging to your, to your buddy about what you just spent on the boat. Few things can dismantle a faith like hypocrisy. So guys, Greco-Roman guys and y'all American guys, you can't get away with it. Now your kids, they may not be listening as much as you would like, but I promise they are watching more than you know. They are watching. And how you live matters. It matters. It matters. Do not exasperate your children. So Greco-Roman guys, American guys, recognize that you have a tremendous potential to mess up your kids if you fail to live out the faith that you proclaim. A tremendous potential. They will follow you because they are watching you. So do not exasperate your children, but instead bring them up. Bring them up. That's um, ektrefo. Bring them up. Ektrefo. Bring them up. Bring them up. Bring them up. This is also a, 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 an, an important passage because, or important phrase because the, the, the Greek word ektrefo, it has at, at its core this concept of nurture. Nurture them up. The, 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 the metaphor in, in, the, in the word is this idea of, of like nurturing a plant. And, and I think this is an important kind of reframe that, that Paul is giving the, you know, his Greco-Roman audience. And this is an important one for us to hear too. Because one of the things that we sometimes do is we're trying to raise up like kind of men, and which is an important thing, raise up fathers, is what we end up doing is just kind of leaning into, into more machismo. But here's the thing, the number one job for dads, the number one job for you is to nurture the children in your care. In other words, dads, you want a metaphor? Here's, here's, here's your target. You, dad, you are a gardener and your family's the garden. You, dad, you're an orchardist and your family is the orchard. You, dad, you're a farmer and your family is the field. Now, it's all fine to, to, to be dragon slayers and think about all that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with that. But don't let that become your dominant metaphor. It's not about who's the strongest. It's not about who can burp the loudest or shoot the, you know, shoot the straightest or crush the most beer cans. It's about the, the legacy you are leaving with your family. And dads, that's your job. To nurture the faith of your children. You're a farmer. What are you? You're a farmer. You're a gardener. You're an orchardist. Make sure you've got the right metaphors, man. Make sure you've got the right metaphors. This, so the, the, ver the very nature of this verse is in some level, it is, it is, a, it is a corrective to the, to the Greek culture of machismo. Culturally, man, you have a lot of authority, especially in the Greco-Roman world. You can, you can argue that maybe it's a little bit different here, but here's, but, but, the dominant metaphor, your, your call from God is to nurture the faith of your family. Bring them up. Ektrefo, ektrefo. Bring them up in the training. Let's talk about that. In the training, in the training. Paideia, in the paideia, in the training. In the, now, training is, is referring to the, uh, to the emotional development of your kids, the training of your kids. 
So um, that's, that sometimes the same word gets used for the discipline of your kids. But it's less about what they know, but how you react to things. How do you handle hardship? How do you handle setback? How do you handle frustration? How do you handle anger? That's what you're training your kids for. And here's where, and this, this uh, uh, take this one with a grain of salt. This, this is from the developmental psychologist, but here's one of the best ways that you train your kids. So just, if I can just send some cheap advice to dads today. One of the best ways to train your kids is you play with them. You play with them. Put it this way, God wants you to rough house with your kids. Wants to, you to rough house with your, especially with your young boys. And here's why. And here's why. Because in the process of rough housing with your kids, this is true also for grandpas and the father figures. I mean, you're teaching your kids that you have strength, but you never, ever, ever use it to hurt someone. You have strength, but you know its limits as well. You have, like, like you're training your kids when they, when, they, when they throw the elbow, when they bop you in the eye, and now you're a little bit hurt. You're training your kids, and this is how, I, how we respond to hardship. This is how we respond to pain. As you're playing board games with your kids, this is, this is how we are good losers. So that's one of the best ways that we train. So little of education happens in the classroom. Then the classroom is vitally important, but most of our education happens outside of the classroom. It happens in the home. And it happens because your kids, your kids, they're watching you. How do you respond to the situations in your life? That's training your kids. So you play with your kids. If your kids are laughing while you're throwing them up in the air, you're probably doing it right. It's teaching them. You can go through hard, even scary things, and you're safe because you never, ever, ever use your strength to hurt. You only use it to direct. Instead, so fathers, bring up your kids. You nurture them in the training, the, that's the emotional training, and then the instruction, the instruction, the nousia, it's a Greek word. In the instruction, that's the head stuff. That's, that's where you're, you're, you're teaching your kids, you're talk. Well, at bottom line is nousia, the instruction, it's talking. You talk, you talk to your kids. You talk to your kids about your faith. Now, that doesn't mean you need to have the answer to every biblical question. Nobody does. In fact, the deeper you go, the, the more comfortable you get with saying, I don't know. Let's say that together. I don't know. I don't know. That's fine. But, but there's some things that you do know. So let, let's cover the basics. God exists. Do you believe that? Yes. Can you tell your kids that? Yes. Can you tell your grandkids that? Yes. Hey, you're doing great. That God loves you. Do you believe that? Yes. Could you tell your kids that? Yes. Could you tell your grandkids that? Yes. Could you tell the kid that delivers the newspaper that? You're doing great. <laughs> Jesus died for you. Do you believe that? Yes. Could you tell somebody that? that? Could you tell your kids that? That's what I'm talking about. But bring them up in the training, that's the emotional, and the instruction, instruction, that's the head knowledge. That's the important stuff that we just need to know. And that doesn't mean you have to have, again, it doesn't mean you have to have the answer to every question. And sometimes actually saying, I don't know, is one of the best things you can do because it, it, just, it, it just models humility. Or another absolutely rich, beautiful phrase that has deep theological impact, are you ready for it? I'm sorry. We model grace in the home. God loves you. God's real. And I'm sorry. And I don't have all the answers. But I do know who does. So fathers, 
Don't exasperate your kids. But bring them up in training and instruction in the... What's the last phrase? Come on. Come on. Help me out. You, listen, you don't make me want to start this one again. Okay. If, I, if I'm the teacher, you're the students, I need you to... I need, you're, like, you're, you're like training and instruction in the... Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. So, so here's, what I, here's, here's what I hope we can spend just a moment with, especially guys. Guys, I need your eyes. Need your, come on. Guys, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want your legacy to be? That's right. Because the way you live models your legacy. And, there, and it's fine to pass on other things. It's fine to pass on your, your love for yogurt containers and epoxy. I, I appreciate that. I really do, actually. Or, or your love for fishing or hunting or music or fixing cars. All that stuff is awesome. But your number one legacy, your number one legacy Gentlemen, fathers, grandfathers, young men who will one day be fathers. Fix father figures. Because biological fatherhood is only the smallest part of what it means to be a father. Fix your heart on your on the on on a godly legacy. Bring them up in training and instruction in the Lord. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave a, leave a little bit of a mark here. If the number one thing you're remembered for is your hobby, if that's the main thing they talk about at your funeral, that's a pathetic funeral. I'm telling you. So make, now there's nothing wrong with that hobby. That's okay. A, your football team, I'm sure it's awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but be real clear at what needs to be at the top of the list. Fix your heart on a godly legacy. Let faith be your number one legacy. Bring them up. Guys, let me see your eyes. I'm almost done. I promise. Grandpa, look up. Let faith be your number one legacy. It is not too late. Part of the truth of the gospel is that it is never, ever, ever too late. That the words, I'm sorry, have tremendous power. That we serve a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. So fix your heart on your legacy. It is not too late. You are breathing and you're listening to what I'm saying right now. So it's not too late. Let faith be your number one legacy, but raise up those who follow you, whether that's your biological children or whoever you get to influence. Bring them up, especially your children, in the training and instruction in the Lord. In the Lord. That's the core of what the Bible teaches us about what it means to be a godly man. You, ha you, you have a measure of authority in the home. And so you use it like a gardener tends for his garden, like an orchardist tends for his trees, like a farmer tends for his field, because you want your field to flourish. You want your trees to be fruitful. You want your garden to grow. Bring them up. I, I, I want to close with, a, with a, a time of prayer together. And so I want to invite all the men in the room to stand. Because here's the other thing. Is I, I, now, I, I just finished bashing on you 
a bit, and, and men of any age, because some of you, one day you're going to be fathers, or you're going to be father figures. And the truth is, it can be really hard figuring out how to be a godly man in today's culture. We, we, have, we have a lot of the same things that were going on in that Greco-Roman world. There's a lot of temptations, and you can get away with a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of internet. There's a lot of opportunity to turn in the wrong direction. So fix your heart. Fix your heart on what you want your legacy to be. It is not too late. And what I'd like to invite us to do is if, is if you are standing next to somebody, you're sitting next to somebody that, you know, right now is standing. And, and even young men, you, got, you, can, you can stand up because, you, yeah, you're part of it. You're part of this. Is, is put, a, put a hand on their shoulder. Put a hand on their back. It's, it's a way even symbolically of saying, I got your back. I got your back. And if you see a guy that's standing by himself, you, let's, let's, see if we, let's see if we can, you, you can move. I give you permission to move in worship so, we can, so, that, so that every guy has, has some, some hand on his, on his elbow, some hand on his back. And let's pray God's blessing, God's strength and God's wisdom on, on this generation of men. Because the stakes are really high. They're really, really high. And these men have a tremendous capacity, whether they know it or not, have a tremendous capacity to influence the next generation. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for godly men. Lord, thank you for the call that you have placed on men. Lord, may they use the strength that you have given them. May they use that to build people up and never tear people down. Lord, guard them against temptation. Lord, guard them against hypocrisy. Lord, guard their legacy. And Lord, for those who are making fresh starts in the way that they live, Lord, would you guard and guide their future? Thank you that in Jesus there is always forgiveness. There's always a second chance. And the story the story of your work in the world and the story of your work in each of these men's lives is not yet finished. So Lord, we pray your blessing on them. Now, if you're standing next to somebody right now, friends, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be quiet for about 30 seconds. I, I just invite you to, whether it's to whisper a prayer or if you're feeling so bold, just to pray a prayer blessing out loud over the, over the person who's whose shoulder your hand is on or whose back your hand is on. Just take a moment and pray. We lift these men up to you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.